but I, I can, <laughs> yeah, I, I put the basic things out and then, you know, day by day, I added and subtracted. So I can tell you before we even get started briefly how I build habitats. Um, I spend the time to familiarize myself with the solid world uh, counterparts to habitat. Some of them I know personally and some of the uh, fire maelstrom, obviously. I'm lucky enough in my life that I have not had that experience. Um, but uh, yeah, sort of immersed in the topic. But then what I do is I look for um, key components. And those are things that are representative of what would make the habitat um, be, um, be whole. If those pieces were missing, then you would not have something that's realistic. So you don't have to have everything, and it wouldn't even be possible to put everything in, but what are the things that are absolutely critical to making a sense of a space? So you notice that there is sound, there is movement, but then um, things like originally I did not have the burned out car, but you put in something like that and it's, oh yeah, that car represents a whole lot of other things. It represents a whole lot of activities and possessions and uh, mobility that is now removed from the people who would have owned the, the car. Car is in front of me over toward the front in the smoke. Yeah, it represents loss of a whole lot of things. So um, that's the key to put in to building habitats, I think, is to put in um, particularly representative um, components that are stand-ins for a whole lot of things that flood your mind with all of the other things that you can't put in. So you'll, you'll notice that if you go to the other habitat builds that I've done, you'll notice that kind of thing. Okay, so these particular, and we'll look at fire first, um, they're done as experiential spaces. So um, the teleporter
So over here it is blocking. Um, Yeah, and and that's the thing, Shiloh. That's rubber boots do melt. You get into a um, fire and it burns the roads. It burns the the um, asphalt. It burns the boots. Imagine what it's like to be in this kind of a place where you feel the heat, where you smell the smoke, where you don't know where the fire is going to go next, where you try to stay where it is either burned out already so that you're not overcome. So somebody asked about California and Australia. Yeah, um, Australia has been in the news in the last month and a half, two months, a lot. California all this past autumn. Um, although you're not hearing about the fires in Australia right this minute, they're not out. They have a lot of rain, but they're not out. They're under control as of two days ago, but they are not yet out. So in Australia, for instance, there have been hundreds of firefighters from all around the world. And it's been weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting work to do this. And even where the fires are somewhat out, you've got the sparks. And then imagine you come on a home. Maybe it's the home of a friend. Maybe it's your home or was. What is that like? The things that you thought you valued are now It burned ash and sticky mess. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should add one. 
Maybe we should, maybe we should add one. So, a number of houses, homes in California over the last few years have burned um, in the forest, the um, fire maelstroms. Um, a lot of them burned in Australia. Um, tens of thousands of people were evacuated. Thousands have lost their homes. But it's not just their homes, it's their businesses, it's their farms, it's everything that they have worked for in their lives is gone. Yeah, that's right, in British Columbia and actually Uh, building houses in the forests of California, not a smart idea, I think, really. Yep. Yep, the Paradise Fire just went right through and burned neighborhoods. But it skipped over some houses. And that's the thing about the... the the fires, they're tricky. So in one of the, in the fire note card, I included um, some um, music. And one of the fires decades ago that changed the way firefighting was done was the Man Gulch Fire in Montana in 1949. And um, you can read about it, but listen to the music, listen to the song, um, and you will hear what it's like to be in a fire. Um, and I actually knew when I was a young child, um, my aunt had known somebody who was a, a smoke jumper in that fire. Um, and he was he was older then, no longer doing that. But um, so I actually knew somebody who was a uh, firefighter, smoke jumper in that Man Gulch fire. Um, back to what we say, somebody was saying about British Columbia. Throughout the entire Arctic Circle this year, there have been uh, forest fires and tundra fires. Um, Fires are a natural phenomenon, and they happen every year, but with the increased droughts, or the more intense droughts in some of the areas, um, that is likely due to climate change, the intensity and, and uh, duration, um, the fires are also more intense and longer. So that more areas have burned this year in the last few years uh, than have in the recent past. Yeah, tundra fires, yes. And you, you don't think of that because you think of tundra as frozen, but the tundra is melting. And so you have the, the uh, heat, and you have the uh, methane, and these are very intense fires, too. And then across Siberia this year, where nobody is living, there were um, very severe forest fires as well. So somebody asked about koalas. Yeah, or somebody was, did you find any? Did you look? Yeah, 
we're not cruel here. So we did not put the, I did not put Kabbalahs into places that are still burning. But yeah, there are some. And the Kabbalahs are, again, representative of other animals. So in some places of the world where there are forest fires, it's going to be raccoons, it's going to be foxes, not koalas. Or more. When the fires subside, nature is resilient. Mother Nature is more resilient than human beings. The animals return. Plant life returns, but not fast enough to feed the animals. So that are dropping. Um, so we have carrots. For a wallaby. Also think of the birds. The budgies in Australia are having a tough time from the fires. Um, people are building and putting out uh, birdhouses so that the, the birds that did have tree cover and nesting spots have places to be. So, somebody mentioned, I guess it was Shiloh who mentioned, uh, and Jan were talking about the drought and particulate matter in the air. And you know there, there seems to be whole cycles here. So if you, um, the University of Maryland has done some research, and I I put a link over here. Photo and a link of some of their research, and so the the Hayes drought storm flood refers to some of the University of Maryland research here. So yeah, you have the particulate matter, and then when you get heavy particulate matter, not only do you get respiratory uh, problems, but you also get rain. So rain, rain, storms. Storms. Free strain. So that you have the, the fires and the rain, you have an interconnected pattern here. And then what happens when you have rain, heavy rain, over areas that are completely dried out? I mean, a normal light rain, um, you're going to get the water sinking into the, the ground. But when you have drought conditions and you have baked land, you don't have the water sinking into the ground, you have the water running off. 
And so you have fire, but then you have flood. So then walk into that, and what is that like? Floods are scary, too. I've been in a flood. Yep. That's right. Yes. And the fire destroy, burns and destroys the house, but floods destroy the houses, too. And some of them are not recoverable afterwards. And so where in fire you only see little remnants after a flood, you can see the things, but they are not recoverable. Does it feel different to you standing here in the heavy rain and the flooding than it does in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. This is why, this is the beauty of 3D platforms and why we are so lucky to have Second Life as a, a platform where we can have immersive experiences. Yeah. That there's a quality of the the sensation, the visceral sensation of immersion that informs the research, informs the information in a way that you just can't get from words. Thank you, Shiloh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, there is. Yeah. So if you, you want to experience that, too, there is a, I will try to, hope the rain doesn't interfere with it, but there is a, yeah. You want to know what it feels like to be on the roof and hoping that someone is going to rescue you. Yeah, try that feeling too. You'll notice there is a an inflatable boat rope. Um, those are free. To take copies. Yeah. Yeah, stranded on the roof and not knowing if the water is going to rise above the roof because sometimes it does. I mean, this is a um, high water mark of what? Uh, 
maybe two and a half meters. But if it's 10 meters, it goes right over the top of the house. And notice also that there was electricity going to this house. There's no longer electricity. So none of the communications that we depend on are going to work here. We hope that you all will use this site as well. You know, this is uh, here for everyone to use. So bring friends, bring classes, uh, bring conferences. Yeah, umbrellas, <laughs> boots, umbrellas, yeah. yes. Yes, it will be here for uh, BWBPE, yes, yep. Now, if you're going to come and use this, there, uh, if you uh, do look for the transparencies, look for the uh, you know, control alt T, you will be able to see that there are two, um, two balls above the, where the rain is. And you should be able to turn the rain on and off that way. The hill that was here before is um, transparent on touch and it's phantom. Yep, right. Uh, some of the Amazon fires are set on purpose, but not all. Um, some of the fires in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's there were also far forest fires um, in the uh, rainforest this year, were also um, set, but not all of them. And in the Amazon, they they clear the uh, the rainforest for mostly grazing, but it, it, it's rainforest soil is not good for uh, long-term growing. It is, uh, it's thin soil um, and it's very good for the trees in the rainforest, but they have shallow roots too. And so the, uh, the soil gives out easily in those areas. And the other thing they do then is they burn to put the uh, biochar back in the soil. Yeah, what Meryl says is that they, they do buy, they uh, use biochar, the, the burned wood for that. Um, Shia, phosphorus is, um, okay, so in all living creatures, on Earth anyway, um, phosphorus is a metabolic catalyst so that all plants and animals here on planet Earth need that to um, be healthy. Um, if you have a too low phosphorus 
either for us or for plants. Uh, you have uh, anemic or not anemic, but you have it impairs the uh, the you don't have healthy systems. Uh, the immune system is impaired. Um, but phosphorus, it's a catalyst. It does not get used up. So if you do composting, then you don't have a problem with phosphorus. But if you do removal of all of the uh, plant material after farming, um, after the crops, then you do have a, a problem with the calcium with the um, phosphorus and so our soils in the US are depleted of phosphorus um, and so we add that back in the form of fertilizer but phosphorus normally in the soil is disper dispersed um, we mine it to use in fertilizer, so it's mined from um, ancient guano sites. Uh, in the U.S., that is the, it's central Florida, um, just in inland from the, the Peace River Basin. Um, the largest supply that we are using right now comes from Morocco. Uh, the island of Nauru in the uh, Pacific was completely removed because the Dutch did the um, phosphorus mining there for uh, decades and decades so that they took the entire top of the island off and there's nothing left but the the uh, rim around the edges and the th few thousands of people who live there are really suffering. Um, yeah, the, the Bergeron, it was the, the Dutch that started the mining in uh, Nauru. Yeah. So it's it could be that bang, but it's it's mostly the seabird. But what we do in the U.S. and what they do in other places, particularly in the U.S., because most of our so much of our uh, farming is done in the Mississippi River basin, and we over fertilize. Then the storms have the runoff into the. Um, Mississippi River so that it be, the phosphorus gets washed down the river um, into the Gulf of Mexico. You end up with algal blooms um, and that is a short-term increase in food for other marine creatures and then you don't have the, it's seasonal, so you don't have the steady um, phosphorus and nitrogen uh, then you have a, a crash in the lifespan of the critters and you have uh, eutrophication of coastal areas of the Gulf of Mexico um, because of the decomposition sucking all the oxygen out of the water. And this, if you look at maps of the globe, you'll find this in all of the major populated coastal areas around the world. Yeah, it's, it's coastal dead zones. Yeah. So I think for me, there are a couple of things here that have been raised. And um, one of the things is that this conversation shows how interconnected things are. That you can't just separate one little aspect here. That if we're going to address some of these really sticky and important issues, we need to look at the um, 
essential environment that supports life on Earth as a system. And when you change one part of the system, what does it do to the rest? So, the, all right, so this kind of gets off the, the edge there, but the, of what we've been talking about, but phosphorus has a couple of different states. This, the uh, phosphorus that, the state of phosphorus that is used in fertilizer is reasonably stable, but not entirely. Um, so phosphorus is also used as an incendiary. So the, the white phosphorus bombs that the military use is a different state of phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is also used as a fire retardant. Go figure. You know, so the different states have different properties. But phosphorus that is in the soil is primarily used as a catalyst um, for uh, life forms, and so it does not change. It's just that if you don't, if you grow plants and you put the the um, waste from the the plant the vegetative waste back, compost it, and put it back in the soil, you don't run out of phosphorus. We're running out of phosphorus because we are making the phosphorus uh, scattered in inaccessible ways. Once it's run down the Mississippi River, for instance, and um, uh, disperses out into the Gulf of Mexico, you can't recover that. No, it, it's not oxidative states. It's a different state of... Um, Yeah. Yes. That's it, tagline. Yes. So, tagline was saying that there are uh, that. Phosphorus, among uh, a number of other elements, have, has a variable valence states. And so, in different molecular configurations and, and bonding, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, so that, you know, uh, Shiloh brings up another point here, and that is that the land will recover, but it will not come back to what it was. So that when you have um, burned off the trees, the tree cover, for instance, you are going to have a different... Uh, the, the new growth is going to be something different. So that you have then, um, the fire will destroy the habitat for what had lived there. Yeah, all plants utilize phosphorus.
It's a metabolic catalyst for living things on Earth. So that when the, and they, they've had this example um, now many places, um, when the forest, the burns out forests get recovered, they get covered, stuff grows there. But something that will be growing will not be the trees that were there. So that the animals um, and the, the whole ecosystem changes. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, one of the other things that I think is pretty important so far as drought and fire is that although this seems to be centered on a few areas of the world right now with changing weather patterns or when weather patterns change, it could happen anywhere. So I live, for instance, in the northeast of the United States. And for the most part, that is a fairly wet area comparatively. Um, but in my lifetime, there has been drought in that area. It didn't last long, but it lasted long enough to deplete the reservoirs so that you could see the, the foundations of houses in old houses in the bottoms of the reservoirs. Um, so it can happen even in places that have not had drought recently. But one of the critical things for me is that around the world, most of the areas that we count on as breadbasket areas, where crops are grown, where um, animals are pastured, those are areas that have, over the, the millennia, been drought prone as well. So that right now we, we hear about the, the fires in uh, Australia, in New South Wales, and the, the houses and the trees that are getting burned. But this is also, the Murray-Darling Basin is also a, uh, a primary crop growing area. So if that happens in a number of places in the world at once, we're going to have food problems. Um, so there isn't any place that I can think of that um, is we count on for food production that is not or has not suffered drought. So you look at India, you look at Africa. You, um, Ukraine has had in recent history droughts that killed crops. The US and Canada, South America, So, again, we need, I think we need to be thinking in a connected way. And um, it's kind of like, to me, playing chess and um, before you make a serious move, keeping your finger on the um, piece that you are considering moving and considering what all the consequences are of the different moves. And this is hard work, but it's going to prevent us from making some, not all, but some decisions that are, uh, have consequences that we could have anticipated but didn't. So each of the signs here has links to articles and some research. Um, look at those, read some of them, add to them. I mean, all of the things here are set to the Science Circle group, so other people should be able to add things in.
this is something that we are going to, this is long-term, these are long-term issues. dry up some of the rain, this is what you have left. You have a different form of de devastation. Yeah. Yeah, I, and we can't set it so anybody and everybody can change things, but but at least the members of the uh, the science circle group should be able to. Yeah, that's a, a, an interesting Thank you, Chantel. Thank you. In in my opinion, this is the beginning of the real power of uh, second life. And how we can use these tools. Yeah. Thanks, Meryl. Right now, the the water here, the flood, is not um, texture texture change. But later today, I will make it texture change. Yeah. So that you all will be able to uh, God powers make it flood and remove it. And so one of the, just for an entirely different, um, there are, in the fire recovery, 
you you saw the koalas, you saw the budgie, you probably saw the um, kangaroo, but did you see the spider? So remember that um, insects are also a an important part. So we forget how critical insects are to and uh, spiders are not just insects but spiders in general to an ecosystem <laughs> yeah Um, because we had drought first, that's why, Jan. So you have the drought, then you have the rain, and then you have the flood. Throughout many places, um, people have been knitting blankets and foot covers and all for, um, for some of the Australian animals who have been burned. Yeah. Yep. So people around the world have been Yeah, I'm really glad to see everyone here. And I just say again, I seriously hope that you all will use this. Because it, it's uh, an educational resource for everyone.
No, I, I think, Di, that people are going to have to reconsider where we build in a lot of ways. I mean, we've been building on coast, coastal areas where the, the, um, we are impacting the environment in very negative ways. We have built in areas of drought prone area, forest areas um, that make it hard not only to keep um, to keep away from the fire but also hard to fight the fires so um, I think there are, there are a lot lots of rethinking including you know, the materials that we build with Thank you, tagline. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
that's the tricky thing. Um, tagline. We can get. Um, you can't really restore an environment, an ecosystem to what it was. You're always going to get something different. Um, so that I mean, ecosystems change over time. They always have. They evolve. Uh, then through all sorts of processes. But when something is um, destroyed or mostly destroyed, because it doesn't, fire doesn't destroy everything. But what grows back is something different than what was there. And the same with flood. Something, whatever grows back is something different. It's a different ecosystem than what was there. And it may be a good ecosystem. It just, it's, I think of it like a kaleidoscope where you see a pattern and um, as soon as you switch the lens just a little bit, it changes the pattern. So, but if you move it back, it doesn't come back to the same pattern. It comes back to something that may look similar, but it is not the identical pattern as what you left. And that's a very simplistic um, set of components, whereas with any ecosystem, you have a very, very complex set of components. Yeah, most little changes have consequences. Some are so small to be unimportant, but um, others that you think are small are not small at all. Yeah, they're not, it's going to be a new normal. You're not going to get the same old normal back again. Just think of it in terms of the trees. The here in this build, the the representation is of a number of different species of trees. They all grow at different rates. Um, they all have their own colonies of critters. Of all different kinds that are associated with them. Um, and so you're never going to get it back exactly like it was. And if you add to that, every little bit is as complex as the, the trees themselves. So you might get back, you might be able to restore to something that uh, serves a similar purpose that, you know, that will be beneficial, but you're not going to get back what was. <laughs> 